Keith Manning, and our debaters on national popular vote and electoral college. All right, good morning. Let's talk about the Electoral College and the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. Um, I'm Hadley Heath Manning. Thank you, Jennifer, for the introduction. I am proud to be a Tony Blankley now senior fellow, and uh, that should explain my shoes. These are the uh, Tony Blankley shoes that are not to spoil anything for tonight, but they are uh, typically awarded to new Blankley fellows. Um, I'm joined today with a couple of distinguished panelists. Uh, let's see, I've got Ted Trimpa immediately to my left, although maybe a lot further to my left. We'll find out. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he is the uh, principal and CEO of Trimpa Group, um, which is a progressive public policy, advocacy, and strategy firm. Um, the Atlantic has called him Colorado's answer to Karl Rove. And uh, I found another interesting tidbit from the Denver Post. Um, says, one of the most important players in Colorado politics you've probably never heard of. Well, that was in the Denver Post 10 years ago, and I imagine a lot more people have heard of Ted Trimpa by now. Um, previous to uh, his work at Trimpa Group, he um, had a decade of government relations and political consulting experience. He was in the government relations group at Brownstein Hyatt Farber Shrek, <laughs> and uh, got his start in politics uh, working for U.S. Senator Nancy Kassebaum. Uh, he has a JD and a BA from the University of Denver. So join me in welcoming Ted Trimpa. Uh, and we also are, are joined today by Trent England, who's the Executive Vice President at the Oklahoma Council of Public Affairs. Uh, he's also the David and Ann Brown Distinguished Fellow at that organization, and prior to uh, working in Oklahoma City at the Oklahoma Council of Public Affairs, he was the Executive Vice President at Freedom Foundation in Washington State, and interim CEO there for some time. Uh, once upon a time, he worked as a legal analyst for the Heritage Foundation, which is an organization some of you may have heard of. And uh, among other issues there, he focused on constitutional issues and helped develop their guide to the Constitution. Uh, his work has been published in the Wall Street Journal, the Christian Science Monitor, and many other publications. He has a, a law degree from the George Mason University, and his BA in government from Claremont McKenna. So join me in welcoming Trent England. Um, so I thought we would start by talking a little bit about the Electoral College and the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact, which Colorado joined this year. And you guys have to correct me if I'm wrong on the statistics, but I believe Colorado became the 12th state to join the Interstate Compact. Is that correct? 16 jurisdictions. 16 yeah. jurisdictions. So we are even further ahead. Now, I, I read that there were now 181 electoral votes? Uh, 196. 196, so my numbers are dated. But 196 electoral college votes are, particular, are, are possibly joining this interstate compact that only takes effect when 270 electoral votes um, from the various states have agreed to this interstate compact, which essentially says that the electors in those states would not follow the traditional electoral college um, system, but would instead cast their ballots for the winner of the national popular vote. And so I thought we would start by talking about that compact and what it means. Um, we have a couple of um, minutes for each debater to offer his opening remarks. And in your opening remarks, if you could touch on what the electoral college is, what this interstate compact is, and whether or not this interstate compact would be the effective abolition of the Electoral College or not, or sort of what the, the ultimate goal of the interstate compact is. Maybe we'll start with Ted. Sure, well first off I just want to say thank you to Jennifer and Rick and to the board of the Steamboat Institute uh, for inviting me back up again. Um, I probably am the leftist person in the room, um, I'm, and I'm proud of that. Uh, but I do want to say that uh, it's really important for people in my world to be at events like this, and I actually think we should have more people here, because uh, I don't believe this country is separated as it's painted out to be in media today, and I can see that just from anecdotal conversations with you. So thank you very much for having me here, and I'm always glad to be here. 
And have the, you did a great job explaining what the compact is. I got my numbers uh, wrong. A lot, of, a lot of people okay. mess it up. Okay. So the interstate compact is a interstate compact, a contract that states enter into by passing legislation. And as Hadley says, it says that you will, compacting state, agree that once there are 270 electors in the compact, cast your electors, whoever wins the all 50 state and District of Columbia popular vote for president. Now, there are a couple, re there are two categories of reasons why um, we believe that this is the appropriate approach. And then the third thing I'll talk about is actually the Electoral College, and it's really not the Electoral College we're talking about, but the winner take all rule. So first off, three quarters of the states in elections get ignored today. Three quarters. 96% of the campaign visits were done in 12 states in 2016. And this means that all of those votes, none of those votes matter. They don't count in a presidential election. So, Ted, why, why would anybody care about that? Because it skews policy making. You think about, not in addition to the fact that people's votes don't count, you think about Medicare Part D, the largest increase in entitlement spending it's in the history since the creation of entitlement spending. Why was it done? It was done by a Republican president, Republican Congress, and guess what? It was to hold the state of Florida. Now, Democrats are just as guilty. The largest SBA loan during President Obama's term went to, you're gonna love this, a ricotta cheese factory. Where? In Ohio. You know, and you have twice as many d disaster declarations in battleground states versus non-battleground states. You have more of the grants that come from the federal government to battleground states rather than non-battleground states. So it's time we believe that every vote in every state should count the same. Thank you. Trent. Yeah, so, so uh, thank you so much to Steamboat for putting this on. I, I completely agree with Ted that one of the reasons we were talking about this before we came up that that I've spent so much time working on the Electoral College and, and studying this, uh, go, going back uh, into the 1990s, but, but really over the last 10 years, is partly because it's an issue where good people can disagree, and uh, I mean there there are uh, you know there there are Democrats who agree with me, there are Republicans who agree with Ted, um, and I, I think that makes it frankly a, a more a more edifying issue to work on. Uh, but, uh, but I do think it's important to go back to the beginning of the Electoral College and then also the beginning of the National Popular Vote Movement to understand what these institutions, what, what the institution is about, what MPV is really about. And uh, if you, you go back to the founding debates at the Constitutional Convention, you actually find a debate like this, a, a little bit, which is, uh, although a little bit, it's James Madison debating himself, because James Madison stands up and he, and he says basically this. He, he says, I'd love to have a national popular vote for president. It, it's simple, right? I mean, it, it, has, it has undoubted appeal, right? It would be a simple way to do it. There was no concern. Sometimes people say, well, they couldn't do it because, you know, they rode horses and it was, you know, it's tough to get information around. That was, not, that was not a concern that was raised at the Constitutional Convention. They could aggregate the votes. It would just take a little bit longer. The concern was the same, the same concern that I have today, which is Madison says, look, the problem with a national popular vote is inevitably the power would wind up permanently vested with the big population centers. And so Madison says, as much as in theory I might like that, it's one of the reasons I love the founders, because you, you, find, this all, you find this all through the constitutional debates, right? In theory, this might look sort of good, but what we care about is whether it actually works in practice, right? And Madison says, in practice, it would not work. It would be a disaster, because it would entrench control of the executive branch in the biggest population centers and leave everybody else out. And so we have an electoral college, which also, I'm sure we'll, we'll get into some of these things, also provides a, a whole bunch of ancillary benefits where I think, uh, I think if you could bring Madison back today, he'd actually say, this works even better than I thought it would, but we'll get to that. <laughs> National popular vote was, was, this interstate compact was created by people who want to abolish the electoral college. Now I know it's supported by some people who, who don't want to abolish the electoral college, or, or that's, you know, that's certainly part of the pitch for NPV because it, it leaves the Electoral College in place, it just sort of manipulates it to get a result that goes against what Madison was trying to do in the Constitution. But it was created by people who said, we want to get rid of the Electoral College, but amending the Constitution is too hard, so let's come up with an interstate compact that changes how states award their electors so that we can get what we want. 
And uh, the, the founder of National Popular Vote, John Koza, uh, a, a very, very smart uh, computer scientist in California, uh, who also invented the scratch-off lottery ticket, so uh, he has lots of winnings to invest in this effort. Uh, John Koza bragged in the New York Times, this is an end run around the constitutional amendment process and around the Electoral College as a state-by-state -state way to elect the President of the United States. Uh, the Electoral College keeps control of elections over, uh, uh, keeps control of elections at the state level and it prevents big population centers from basically controlling the executive branch without listening to everybody else. And uh, for, for those reasons, I think we should keep the Electoral College as it is. Uh, no election system is perfect, but it has uh, stood the test of time. Ted, do you want to respond? Is it the abolition yeah. of the Electoral College in your no. view? And the simple fact of what Trent is ignoring is that this isn't about the Electoral College. This is about the winner-take-all rule. The winner-take-all rule says that whoever wins the most popular votes within that state, all those electors go to that presidential candidate for that particular state. The winner-take-all rule was never debated in the Constitutional Convention. It is not, it's not part of what the discussion was, and it is uh, never mentioned in the Federalist Papers. And so what we really should be talking about is how the winner-take-all rule skews public policy making and how it would be better for the United States uh, to get rid of the winner-take-all rule and move to a national popular vote. Now, the other thing that I want to mention is it's great to talk about what was mentioned at the Constitutional Convention, ideas about you know, different ways of voting, but in the end, they couldn't agree. And what was written in the Constitution is really simple language. Each state shall appoint in a manner such as the legislature thereof may direct a number of electors. This language, let's, we're all strict constitutionalists here, this language has been held by two different Supreme Courts to say states have the exclusive and plenary authority to determine how their electors are chosen. And this is exactly what the Founding Fathers intended, was that the states could do it the way they wanted. The way the winner-take-all rule came about was that if you were a state that didn't do winner-take-all rule, you were giving up half of your electors. By 1880, over half the, actually by 1880, most of the states did winner-take-all rule. This went to the Supreme Court saying it's fair to those states that's not, and the Supreme Court state said, because of the plain language of the Constitution, tough. You know, if it disadvantages you, it disadvantages you. So I have to confess that I took an Uber here this morning from a different part of Steamboat Springs, and my Uber driver asked me a question, and I thought while we're having this discussion about the history of the Electoral College, this question fits in, my Uber driver I told him, I said, I'm moderating a debate on the Electoral College this morning. He said, oh, you mean the racist institution that is an artifact of our history as a slave-owning <laughs> country? And so I wanted to ask Trent if he would respond to that because, you know, understandably, people who oppose a national popular vote are concerned about urban centers, mm -hmm. but I guess there's um, a perception that the Electoral College weighted our presidential system in favor of less populous states that were more rural and perhaps slave owning. What do you say to that? Yeah, no, and, and this has been, uh, I mean, many people will have seen uh, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's comments just yesterday, I think, um, saying that same thing. And uh, it, 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 is, it is simply, I mean, while it is true that, that race-based slavery is the original sin of our country, and I think that we should be serious about that, um, it is not true that it was the primary motivating factor behind the Connecticut Compromise, which shaped Congress, which is what the Electoral College is based on. I mean, if you think about the Electoral College, it's actually just sort of a pop-up Congress, if you think about the, the math behind it. Um, it's a Congress that, you know, that, that's, that is uh, sele selected by the states, you know, exists just to elect the president, and then it goes away. And uh, so that's the, the implication there is that is really not so much about the Electoral College. It's really about the, the compromise that created Congress and the U.S. Senate. And the fact is, there were small states in the South uh, there were small states in the north, and, and I, I always think it's, it's just a strange argument that people make where, where they ignore the, the real political dynamics, which as you mentioned, New York and Virginia were the big states, one in the north, one in the south. Um, they both had slavery at the time of the founding, but New, York's, uh, New York was in the process of abolishing it, thanks to people like Alexander Hamilton. And uh, it, it, was, it was not the reason why we have the Electoral College. And, uh, and, and frankly, if you, if you go forward in history, and maybe we'll, we'll come to this later, if you look at the post-Civil War elections, the Electoral College actually prevented racist vote suppression 
from stealing the White House in at least one election, right? And so we've actually seen, whatever the founders' in intentions were, whatever was in anybody's mind, we've actually seen, seen the Electoral College protect minority interests, and specifically, in that case, freed slaves and their, their ancestors in the 1870s and 1880s, protect them. Uh, and, and so I, you know, I think we should look at, look at that history, too. Well, my response to that would be, I think what Ocasio-Cortez is talking about, and I have to say, as a avowed liberal, I'm not in that camp. I think she's a danger to the party. Um, so I just want to be on record as saying that. But she's so much fun. Uh, I can tell you, the one, the one great thing about Ocasio-Cortez having the kind of attention she's been having is we're no longer going to see Nancy Pelosi on mail pieces. <laughs> So uh, I, I think, though, where uh, her comment about it being racist and then what the, the cab driver was talking about is probably more about when they were trying to do the constitutional amendment in the 70s to get rid of the Electoral College and the agreement that was made from some senators in uh, New York with some senators in the South. And it was in part around race and protecting uh, certain power centers of race because this was back when New York was a battleground state. But there's a, a kind of a theme that keeps running through Trent's comments, and that is big states are gonna control, big cities are gonna control, and we have to think about what, what the country looked like at the time of the founding fathers. You know, we're talking 13 states. So if you have two big ones, you only have 11 other states. Today, we may have 10 big states, 11 big states. They only represent the, for example, well, let's take the 11 biggest states represent um, like what, 112, I'm trying to remember the number, and then the other 38 states, basically the 11 states and 38 states represent the same number of people. And with big cities, if you take the top, um, top 11, 10 cities is 15% of the, po no, top 10% is 8% of, uh, of the population in the country, and the top 50 cities um, is only 12% of the population. The, this idea that big cities or big states are going to control the election, the arithmetic just doesn't support it. And you, the other thing you have to think about is that assumes that big cities are always going to vote all Democratic and that big states are going to vote, which is actually not the case. Historically, when you take a look at the largest states, the highest percentage that Democrats have received overall when you average it out is 63%. That is the same for the remainder 38 states for Republicans. And so what that says to us is that this country really is pretty much 50-50. And when you take a look at rural, another, another example, one-sixth of the people live in urban centers in the United States, one-sixth live in rural areas. And the same kind of percentage flip applies for that one-sixth. The rest of the country lives in the outside urban areas, the suburbs and exurbs. And in those, in those areas, historically, presidential elections have been almost 50-50. So again, what this is saying is the country is pretty much 50-50 and there isn't a controlling, for example, rural areas aren't controlling it just as much as the collection of the 11 big states are controlling it. The, the, the problem with that is, and, and I, I mean, and you can see this in political science, but you can also see it if you go out and, and work for a candidate. I ran for the legislature in Washington State in 2006 in a district where uh, we had some tightly packed suburbs and we had some very rural areas with people with big dogs down long driveways. And every, every voter was equal, right? Every voter was mathematically equal in, in that campaign. Um, but you'd be, you'd be crazy to treat every voter the same um, because uh, we live in a world of finite resources, right? The, 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 the lady down the long driveway with a big dog um, was not going to get as much attention as the people who lived in suburban uh, housing developments, right? I mean, it's it just, it just a common sense matter uh, to, to put it, you know, in a political science-y way, right? The, 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 the political organizing is easier as population density goes up, which means that in a world where, you know, where there are no checks and balances in the election system and everybody's just mathematically equal, um, big cities are going to tend to have more power, plus they also tend to have more wealth. But here's the real numbers, because these numbers looking at cities rather than metro areas are very misleading. Who here thinks that you live in a state, because I know we have people from all around the country, who here thinks you live in a state that has more people in it than the three biggest metro areas in the country? Anybody? Anybody think they live in a state like that? Anybody from, are you from California? Okay. The gentleman back there who's from California thinks he lives in a state that has more people than the biggest three metro areas in the country. I'm sorry, sir, that's incorrect. 
The biggest three metro areas in the country have 42.8 million people. California has about 41 million, right? Uh, New York, LA, Chicago. The three biggest MSAs from the Census Bureau have more people than California. Uh, the, if, you, if you look uh, just at the cities, um, there's 15 million, but if you look at the metro areas, there's 42.8 million people, and certainly they, they don't all vote Democrat. I, I actually, I think we should be careful not to make this too much of a partisan debate, Republicans versus Democrats, right? I, I mean, there are, there are urban Republicans, there are rural Democrats. I live in Oklahoma, I know that very well. Um, and uh, what, what I think we should protect is a system that, that does say, look, you can't win the presidency by running up the score where you're already popular, and you can't build a coalition based around the biggest metro areas in our country, whether you're a Republican, a Democrat, whether you're Bloomberg running as an independent or, or whatever it is, you, you can't build a coalition like that and, and have a lock on the presidency because you cater to a handful of big metro areas in the country. I don't, I don't want to interject too much at this point because I think we are now more or less at the heart of the debate, how votes count and how people are represented. But I do want to mention, we're talking so much about what would happen, what might happen in terms of campaigns or policy making if we changed our presidential election system significantly, but we do have some history about a change in our elections, at least for US senators. And so I wanna interject here and ask both of you to respond. Uh, prior to 1914, U.S. Senators were elected by the state legislatures. And as I believe starting in 1914, all of the states elected their U.S. Senators directly as we do now. Um, Coloradans will have a, an opportunity to vote in a U.S. Senate election in 2020, as will people in many other states. And we will see the names of the people on the ballots and we will cast votes directly for one of the candidates for U.S. Senate. That wasn't always the case in U.S. history. So, is there any evidence? What can we learn from that? Was it beneficial? Um, did it change policy making in any way? I'll start with Ted. Well, first off, given I'm from Colorado and Democrats just swept everything here, including a completely Democratic legislature, being completely self-interested, fine, let's go back to the legislature picking it and then we'll have two really good Democratic senators. I mean, that shows how, you know, how transient these putting, partisan arguments are. Putting, yeah. putting that aside, uh, what, what this argument is touching on are, is two things. One, how do you protect small states? And two, a confusion about at the Constitutional Convention, the Grand Compromise, which was in July, about how the Senate was going to uh, be comprised and how that is separate from the Electoral College. Because a lot of people combine those two, and you shouldn't. So let's talk about the first piece in terms of protecting small states. That is true. The United States Senate was designed to protect small states. Montana has two senators, California has two senators. And that was definitely part of the debate, that was part of the compromise that they made, and that the House would be proportionally represented based on population. On the second point, the compromise of 1850 in which the senators were picked by the state legislatures has to be kept separate from the Electoral College, because the Electoral College decision wasn't made until September 4th at the 1787 convention, whereas the 1850 compromise was done on July 7th. So I think it's important to keep those, th those two separate. Now, is it a good thing or is it a bad thing? I'm for national popular vote, so I'm gonna say that the people should elect. I think we need to be really careful that as we have a process, for example, how we elect a president, where we now have had five elections where the, uh, the candidate won the Electoral College and not the popular vote. And you know what, two of those was, are very, very recent. We're gonna have more of those here in the upcoming future just because our, our country is so closely divided. And what is that going to do and what does that say to the rest of the country? And particularly, imagine what would happen if in this next election the Democratic candidate won the Electoral College and Donald Trump won the popular, I mean, and won the popular vote but lost the presidency. I mean, it, it, it will be a really unfortunate situation in terms of how I think people are gonna respond, and that's the reason why every vote in every state should count in every election just the same. It's, it's interesting, I mean, people on the left have been saying that going back to the, the 70s, and, and probably the 50s, um, when there was another effort in Congress to try to get rid of the Electoral College, and JFK was the big defender of the Electoral College, by the way, in the yeah, 50s as a, as a senator. 
Uh, but, but they've been saying, you know, if, if we ever have an election like this, there's going to be riots in the streets and Americans are going to go crazy. And, and, you know, 2000 rolled around. And, and uh, of course, every state mattered in 2000, by the way, a rebuttal to this idea that only, only a couple states mattered or only Florida mattered. George W. Bush had lost any of those states, or Al Gore had managed to win any of those states, including his home state. Uh, the election would have gone differently. Every single state mattered in 2000, as, as every state matters in, you know, in, in a certain sense in every election. Uh, but uh, uh, Americans seem to be more law-abiding than, than some of my progressive friends think they are, which I think is a good thing. Uh, but uh, no, I, I think th th these issues are all linked. I mean, this is, uh, this is the reality of a constitution. All these things, all these checks and balances work together. It's a political ecosystem. I often use this analogy because uh, I went to school in Seattle and they talked a lot about ecosystems, right? And they, they drilled it into our heads, right? If you, go, if you go out and you make some change in the ecosystem, you can't just say, well, you know, that animal's gone anymore. So too bad for that animal, but nothing else is gonna change, right? The whole thing's gonna reorder itself. And to the, to the 17th Amendment point, um, the, the 17th Amendment, creating the direct election of U.S. Senators, fundamentally changed our constitutional system. And the best example of that is if you go to Washington, D.C. right now, and you, go, uh, uh, you, you, you walk um, out of Union Station toward the United States Senate, there's a couple of buildings on your right, and in those buildings are lobbyists for the states. I'm sure Colorado has a, some contract lobbyists there. Um, those, including me. Those, those people are, are lobbying for state governments because in 1913, the power of state governments in Washington, D.C. that was in our Constitution from the beginning was taken away. And it, it made possible things like the New Deal, which was intentionally designed to steer money around state governments to, to take legislatures and governors out of uh, controlling that, that some of those funds that came into states th through the New Deal to make them, Amity Schles has written brilliantly about this, to make state governments appeal to be basically incompetent and to give more power to the federal government. Uh, and, and all those things, those things are made possible by the 17th Amendment. I think it's the right argument that we should have about what NPV would do. And it wouldn't, of course, you know, it wouldn't mean that um, everybody's just magically equal and every state gets equal attention. It would just mean that different places would get, get more attention and different places would get less attention than today. You can't take the politics out of politics. Let me ask this because we've been talking about the state's power to direct electors to vote in a certain way or not in a certain way. Um, why the national popular vote interstate compact? Why not go about this a different way? So for example, Maine and Nebraska don't have a winner-take-all system. They have a, a district system. And I want to ask both of our panelists what the implications would be if rather than an interstate compact, more states simply started to follow that model of Maine and Nebraska where there are a couple of electoral votes, if I understand correctly, that go to the state's popular vote winter, winner, but then other votes are apportioned by district. What would that mean for the Electoral College if states took it upon themselves, um, more states, additional states took it upon themselves to follow that model? I'll start with Trent, and I want to hear from Ted. Why not um, lobby for change that way rather than via the interstate compact? It's a really good model, I think, for Maine and Nebraska, for, uh, partly because they're small, they're not especially gerrymandered, and, and basically the, you, know, you have a, a Democrat-leaning state, a Republican-leaning state, that where they've made the calculation that uh, you know, they basically have one congressional district that's a swing district, it attracts more attention to their state. Um, in, a, in a highly gerrymandered state, a state with many more congressional districts, uh, it, you know, it is reducing the power of the state in presidential elections, right? Winner take all is, is, the, is a calculation that, that maximizes the state's power in presidential elections. That's why most states have gone to that. Uh, so I don't, I think it's good that states have that power. The court case that, that Ted mentioned um, was about that. It wasn't about whether states could, could ignore the will of their own people. It was about do states have the power to decide how to reflect the will of their own people through the congressional district method or winner take all or something else. Proportional has been talked about. I think right. proportional was on the ballot here, right, in 2006? 2006. Uh, which, I mean, in my mind, if you want something that, that is more mathematically equal but still allows states to keep control of elections, uh, proportional is a very reasonable way to do that. Um, what you don't want to do is, is tell Colorado voters, hey, we don't care uh, how you voted in Colorado at all. Um, we're going to, to give away our electoral votes based on the will of people in other states. And by the way, um, if, if, you know, if you as Colorado voters think that some other state is, is doing something nefarious with their elections, uh, national popular vote is a 
100% trust but, but not verify system where Colorado would have to certify an election result and just take other states at, at their word. Okay, there's like three different arguments that are, that, 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 that are going on, Trent. <laughs> a lot so to respond to. <laughs> I've got to unwind some of this. The overall kind of theme that I think we all need to remember and that, uh, and I have a lot of respect for Trent, we've been getting along really well prior to the debate, <laughs> is. And we will after. Is, and we will after, we'll drink together. Um, is that he's ignoring what the essential problem is and the essential problem is the winner take all rule because it focuses policy attention and electoral attention to 12 states. And those 12 states aren't picked by some magical formula. There isn't something within how the Electoral College was set up that makes them important states. It's solely because they're competitive states um, in presidential elections. And then that means that all these other states get left out. And what I also find fascinating is, you know, Trent will talk about you know, the New Deal and what's going on and it was transferring power uh, from, the federal, you know, from the states to the federal government. This is the most state-based, constitutionally conservative approach you could have in order to elect the president because it preserves the electoral college. Let's say you know, some of the horribles that Trent is talking about in the national popular vote happens states can still go back and reverse out of the national, national popular vote uh, compact. You couldn't do that with a constitutional amendment. That is preserving the power to the states. I mean, how much more 10th Amendment can you get than that? Now, to proportional and to congressional district. If you go to a congressional district plan, you essentially are gonna go from battleground states to battleground congressional districts. It really is that simple. For proportional to even begin to work, all the states need to go to proportional at the same time. If you have individual states going to proportional over a period of time, those states are just giving away what their electoral votes are. The other piece is, how do you count the electoral votes if you have an odd number? How do you divide up what the percentages are going to be? The simplest approach is to take the power that's vested in the Constitution to the states, an exclusive and plenary power that they can appoint their electors how they want and have they appoint their electors in a way that ends up doing a uh, national popular vote for the, for the president. I think this <laughs> argument about swing states, it, it, I mean, think about it this way, right? Um, there are swing Senate districts, right? And a, lot of, and a lot of those things line up. And when you talk about, you know, port going into swing states, it, it, you could attribute that just as much to where swing Senate districts are, where swing congressional districts are. Everybody knows a lot of the power in Congress winds up with people who've been there a long time, um, right? And so, we, I mean, you, you can't take the politics out of politics. The idea that uh, ripping state lines out of presidential elections means that you're not going to have uh, pork barrel spending or you're not going to have candidates in, in Congress and in the White House um, still trying to do things that are in their political interest. It, it's just not true. I mean, it, it, it doesn't work that way. And as I said, as a, as a candidate in a single member district where all the votes are equal, I saw that up close. That's, that's just not how politics works. If, Maybe we wish it worked differently, but, uh, but like James Madison at the Constitutional Convention, what we should be interested in is how things actually work on the ground in real I, life. I want to let Ted respond, and then I want to put everybody on warning in the audience that I'm about to go to you for questions. So be thinking of your best questions for these panelists. Are there cards? There are cards, excellent. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Um, so Ted, please respond, and then I will start calling on folks from the audience for questions. If only what Trent is talking about is true, it is still clear when you take a look at battleground states and the amount of additional resources that they receive and how it skews public policy. Let's, let's take the resources out of the equation. And I, just for purposes of argument, Let's grant what Trent is talking about in terms of the amount of money in swing Senate districts is what made it happen. Well then, how do you explain Medicare Part D with a Republican Congress, Republican president? How do you explain steel tariffs in Pennsylvania? How do you explain this? So the BP disaster happens in the Gulf. Oil hits the, you know, the beaches of Texas, hits the beaches of Louisiana, hit the beaches of Mississippi, hit the beaches of Alabama, hit the beaches of Florida. President Obama was in Florida the next day. That is a skewing of how we do public policy. I live here in Colorado, I'm a Democrat. President Obama 
from 08 to 12, came to Colorado so many times, we started having get difficulty getting people to show up. Because they're like, oh my God, he's here again? You know, and in our party, he's revered. So we've, we've got to remember on the skewing and how the winner-take-all rule, and that is the essence of the problem, not the Electoral College, the winner-take-all rule, it's skewing public policy, which is not healthy for the country. I, I do want to go to the audience, but first I want to hear Trent explain Medicare Part D and the BP oil spill and, and the terrible yeah. things that the Electoral College is responsible for. No, I, it's, you know, again, it's, here's, here's what happens if you take away the Electoral College, right? I mean, you don't, David Plouffe and Karl Rove don't vanish, right? I mean, presidential candidates don't say, well, I don't need you guys anymore because every voter's equal, right? I'm just going to go out and start talking to people and, you know, eventually I'll get to 350 million or whatever. And, right, it's, it's a, again, it's a, I, I wish we could do that. Um, but that's not how the world works, right? You would, then David Plouffe, Karl Rove, Ted Trimpa, right, they would, they would sit down and build a campaign strategy around something. And, and I, I think it would have to be, where are the most people? And then you do polling, and I, I, I've participated in polling like this, where you're looking at not so much what people believe, but how easy it is to change their minds. And you build a profile of how easy it is to change certain people's minds, and then you'd, you'd compare that to population density. And so if the suburbs of Houston are where you, you think you can swing uh, 500,000 votes, Right? Well, then, if something happens in Houston, you're going to be in Houston. And if something happens in Pensacola, and you've looked at this, the polling for Pensacola, and you say, ah, Pensacola, uh, you know, those people are pretty set in their ways, you're not going to Pensacola. Right? You're still going to have politics in politics. I, just, I think that's the, the problem with this. I don't, I don't like pork barrel spending. I don't like the way, you know, I'm more concerned with the way Congress works than, than uh, I think the executive these days, or the way it doesn't work. Uh, but, uh, but, I, I just, I always appeal to people, go through the, the sort of war gaming process. If you were a political campaign consultant for a presidential campaign under MPV, right, how would you do it? And you would do it, and the fact that you would do it some way is, is really the I'm the sure rebuttal. Ted would, would do a very good job because he's got a yeah. <laughs> background one, in political consulting. One minute, consulting. If, if, one only, minute and then we'll if only the arithmetic supported what Trent is saying. If we want an example how a presidential campaign would be run if it is a nationwide or all 50 state and district of Columbia campaign, take a look at how it happens in Ohio. Ohio is an example, for, it's a battleground state. You know, the presidential candidates have to win it. A presidential candidate, when they were running, they, this would, let's take in 2012, because it's the one we have the best data, they visited every single county. The percentage of visits that the people, the areas of the state got was based on the number of people that they, that they had there. And there wasn't one county that didn't receive some type of visit. There wasn't one county that didn't receive some type of money. And we're gonna have the same thing happen with the national popular vote. Now, is every single state and every single county gonna get a presidential candidate to stop in their, stop in their state? No. But if you think about you know, the 30 some odd states, 38 some odd states that get ignored in a presidential election, they're now at least going to get something. And something is better than nothing. I'm going to try to uh, proportionally allot questions in the districts <laughs> of this room. Um, so if you have a question, please raise your hand and I'll uh, direct, looks like Jordan with the mic oh. over there. Someone's right behind you, Jordan, so we're gonna start right there. So uh, this week, the 10th Circuit in Denver uh, entered a decision on faithless electors, which was uh, to say that electors cannot be bound to vote by state statute, which is in conflict with the Washington State Supreme Court decision that says, yes, you can. What do you think the implications are for the national popular vote uh, debate, uh, as well as the Electoral College generally? So, if I can jump in on that, one thing I will warn people is there's, there's reporting out on this that is not correct. And I just, I read a Fox News story on this this morning that I'm sorry to say um, it implied something about all this that's not right. And I think Ted and I probably agree on all this. It, it, it has very little effect on the debate over the national popular vote interstate compact because you have to remember, or, 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 or maybe, uh, maybe you'll find out now for the first time, electors are real elected officials who are nominated at state political party conventions. So when the, the, the Colorado Democrats, Colorado Republicans have their state conventions, they nominate a slate of electors. And what the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact would do, and this is where Fox News got it wrong, 
it is not tell the electors how to vote, it would change which electors get elected. And so if the Republicans win the popular vote and Democrats win Colorado, well, the Republican electors, you know, vice versa, the, the Republican electors would be elected. And the reason why the faithless elector uh, issue always sounds like a bigger deal than it, than it really is, is that, I mean, these people, whether or not they're going to be imprisoned for going against uh, how they were supposed to vote, uh, they have pledged to their party and been nominated by their party because their party believes that they will follow through on their pledge to vote for the party's nominee, which is why every faithless elector ever has been trying to send a message and never trying to swing an election. Uh, but I, I, do, I do expect it will go to the And I actually Court. I agree with Trent on the, it's not as big of a deal as people are making it out to be because what will happen is you'll just have better vetting with it, you know, at the state conventions as to who they're picking to be the elected. Because keep in mind, that language with the Constitution says, you know, the legislature shall appoint, they appoint the legislature, and the legislature in terms of adopting winner take all has allowed within these parties and nominated conventions to do this selection. And another interesting fact, Bob, is, you know, prior to this last election, the last 57 presidential elections, there were, were 22,000 991 elector votes cast. Of that 22,991, you know how many were faithless? 17. So this is a problem that people are making out to be much bigger than what it really is. Okay, next question. Over here. Okay. Uh, this is a very interesting debate, but I think we have to go a little further into this and it deals more with voters, okay? Voter ID, showing proof of citizenship, proof of residency, and last but not least, proof of life. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna let Ted, <laughs> I'm gonna let Ted take this one. <laughs> well, actually, as a Democrat, as much as I am uh, very troubled by Republican states and the voter suppression tactics that are happening. Um, oh, surprise, surprise, come on. Here we go. Under, <laughs> under the National Popular Vote Compact, it doesn't change any of that because state elections are still run by the states. And that is an important difference between doing National Popular Vote by constitutional amendment or doing National Popular Vote by an interstate compact. National, a, an amendment, constitutional amendment, would require that you create some type of federal election process. Under the compact, it's the states who still run all of the elections. So if the state wants to do ID requirements, um, whatever, they still can. They're not prohibited from doing it. So this, this is where, um, <laughs> I, I got involved in this because I worked on election security policy in Washington State and we saw this and recognized the, the just tremendous threat um, to election integrity directly and indirectly from the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. And, uh, uh, and, and this is the, the, the challenge in this debate because, I mean, I'm, I'm gonna take Ted at his word. He likes the Electoral College. The people behind the National Popular Vote don't like the Electoral College. They don't want us to wind up still having the Electoral College. They prefer it go away. If you look at the history behind the 17th Amendment, there was actually a, a somewhat similar strategy to throw a whole bunch of sand in the gears until people finally threw up their hands and said, look, we'll, we'll, you know, we will abolish the role of state legislatures in choosing senators and, do, and give you what you want because you created so much confusion in this process. My view is that some of the people behind NPV, um, that's, that's, that's their end game. But, but look, even if it's not, here's the reality, right? In, in NPV, Colorado has passed it, California has passed it. California has jurisdictions where they want non-citizens to vote. Now, not in presidential races, they say, right? And, and legally, right, they can't, but California votes entirely by mail. They have same-day registration. Washington State, where I came from, votes entirely by mail. The ballots only have to be postmarked on election day, which means the day after election day, while they're counting, they know exactly how many votes they need, um, which is how the 2004 governor's race was stolen in Washington State. Uh, they found just the right number of votes that they needed uh, to steal that election. NPV says this. 
trust us. Trust every other state, right? Every state in the compact would be certifying its own version of the national popular vote total. You literally would have as many, as many national popular vote totals certified as there are states inside the compact. And they're all asked to, to trust every other state with no power to verify. The reality is nobody would put up with that. People in this room would demand that the federal government take power over elections because it would be your only act of self-defense against vote fraud in other states. If, and so you'd have to do that. If only what Trent was saying is true. Um, <laughs> let's talk about California first, and then let's talk about the certification of votes in the states. So on the California piece, uh, a number of our Republican supporters will say over and over that if you go to a national popular vote, you're going to see an increase in Republican vote turnout because a lot of Republicans in California don't vote because it doesn't matter. It really doesn't get counted. And so let's remember that by going to a national popular vote, both sides have an incentive to actually start voting. We can argue about voter suppression, what all, what all of that means. In terms of the cer certification problem, what Trent is talking about today, if what he's talking about today, would be a problem under the current system. And it's not under the current system because the Constitution and federal law lays this out really clearly. The canvas of the vote is counted once the state certifies a vote through all administrative hearings. Congress still counts those votes. That has to happen before the Electoral College meets. And we're not seeing this problem today, so why would we be seeing this problem if we went to a national popular vote? I want to interject a question here about sort of the legitimacy of these two different systems, because I do think it's a problem for the Electoral College when we have recent elections where the popular vote total doesn't match the outcome of the Electoral College at a time when, by the way, Americans generally have the least faith in a lot of big institutions, including our government. Um, but on the flip side of the coin, I've, I've heard the argument that under a national popular vote interstate compact, and, and forgive my numbers again if I'm wrong, but as many as 13 times in American history, the elected president has only won a plurality of votes. And so I wanted to ask you, Ted, what would happen in a situation like that if there's no majority winner, if there's a plurality winner, if that would call into question the results of the election or if the winner of the plurality is, if, if you expect that Americans would accept that outcome as legitimate. We've had, actually, the number is 18. Wow, there we go. And you take a look at the presidents have been elected by plurality. None of it, is, none of it has been below 38, and 38 was an outlier number. And guess you know which president that was? One of the greatest presidents that we had, Abraham Lincoln. You take a look at this country and the history of voting, there's no indication when you're looking at history that there's going to be a problem with that, particularly when you look at gubernatorial elections. There have been over 5,000 gubernatorial elections. If there's going to be a problem with this low percentage of uh, candidates being able to win, we would have seen it after we had 5,000 elections. But, but you, can't, you can't say, um, we don't need the system right now because the history we have under the system that we have right now shows that we wouldn't have a problem if we changed the system. You follow that, right? Uh, I mean, our, our electoral college shapes the ecosystem of our politics, which, which trickles down to, to state-level elections, including governor's races, right? And the, the reality for Lincoln, uh, for Clinton, who, who, you know, Bill Clinton won, I think, uh, his first time with 41.8 or something like that, um, is that at least the electoral college required that they draw that plurality from a geographically distributed area, right? You couldn't, he, I mean, you could win 38%, uh, 41% um, from, uh, you know, California, New York, Illinois, right? I mean, you, you, could, you could win uh, in, in a few more states, right? You, you could win a regional or just, you know, or the South, right? Like was happening in the late 19th century. You could win a plurality from a region. That's what's really dangerous. If you win a plurality and it's spread across the whole country, Right? That, that's, that is not as dangerous and basically it does provide a floor. And this is why other countries, um, there are very few major foreign countries that use a direct, uh, a, a national popular vote to elect their president. Uh, in France, you look at France's last presidential election, 600,000 French voters cast blank ballots in protest because they did not like the fact that in the final round of their election, they were forced to choose between someone who got 21% and someone who got 23%. Right, the majority of French people were against the two candidates in that, in that national popular vote system. It's not a, it's not a panacea. 
With my well, apologies to Ted, I want to take one more question from the audience, and then I'm going to take closing remarks from both of you. We've covered so much ground. I commend this audience member for asking about voter ID, because that sparked a good conversation about the legitimacy of these two systems and how they might be accepted and so forth. So uh, looks like I have a, a question in the back. Sorry. Jordan's got the mic, so yes, he's in charge. Uh, I think this is a, a very important debate. But I think it really loses sight, sight of the bigger issue. And the bigger issue is that there is a lot of uh, voter alienation in our country, OK? And if we don't move back to a system where every voter feels his vote counts, he or she's, her vote counts, then we are going to lose the war, OK? So uh, I think as we move you know, along with this issue of national popular vote or whatever, it's really important to keep in mind there are other issues out there that are maybe more important. That is gerrymandering, for example. If we don't get rid of gerrymandering in this country, then there's going to be more and more voter alienation. If we don't get rid of voter suppression in this country, there's going to be more and more voter alienation. And it's this younger generation going forward that is really important. They are fe they feel alienated right now. Gerrymandering yeah. and yeah. Uh, so it's important to move to Thank you. Part. I'll start with okay. that. On the gerrymandering point, I couldn't agree with you more. There are a number of, and I'll use this language as in, which is in conservative Republican language, there are a number of democracy reform measures that we need to do. One, to address that kind of issue, but to the extent we can, take some of the corruption out of the political process. Um, and I also agree with the first point. If we don't start making every voter feel like their vote counts, we're creating problems over time, which is why, why not take the most conservative approach that's constitutional, that's state-based, and preserves the Electoral College in order to make sure that each one of those votes count and that voter feel like, feels like their vote counts when they're voting for president. I, I happen to agree with the point that a lot of voters feel alienated and discouraged and feel like they're their voice doesn't matter whether it's at the ballot box or elsewhere. There's a lot of general discontent and discouragement with our political system on both sides of the aisle. But I want to ask Trent to respond to that and you know, what besides a, a huge overhaul of our electoral college system would help more Americans feel that their voices were heard or that their votes mattered? Yeah, no, I, it's, a great, it's a great question. It's an important question. Um, the proof that NPV is not the solution is France and Canada. Right, Canada's parliamentary, um, and uh, and so you know Canada, they're not directly electing a prime minister in Canada, um, but Canada has very very high voter turnout, uh, and and uh, you could also and the proof that it's not just about swing states or safe states, is the Northeast, because if you look at the political culture in New England states, uh, they they tend to have very high turnout whether they're safe or swing states. And, and so there's something going on there, but it's not, it's not just about, uh, it's, it's, not a, it's not so much about this. And I would also say, uh, as important as the issue is, I, I think sort of voter self-esteem is not a test of, of an election system, right? Uh, you know, I feel disenfranchised might mean, well, your civics teacher didn't teach you why the Constitution is so important and why it's so important to have a system of states. Uh, I think the real problem, I think NPV would actually make it worse is that uh, we have entered into this age, not, uh, social media I think is a part of it, but I really think it's the, the, the cable news, 24 hour news cycle that sucks all of our attention to be focused on national issues in Washington DC. And one of the reasons I left DC is because I, I think that we have to focus more on our states and on our communities. I think if we could reorient voters, not to thinking, oh, the pre I just want a president who represents me. I mean, what a silly idea in a country of 350 million people. What does that even mean, right? But, but I can make a real difference in my city, my county, my state. So that's, I would appeal to all of us to, to try to shift our focus and draw the young people around us to focus on the governments closest to us to try to get people engaged where it matters most. I know Ted wants to respond. And Please in the do. meantime, what you have happened is that you're still allowing 12 states to control a presidential election. 96, 94% of presidential visits go there. The vast majority of money spent in a campaign goes there and it skews what federal policy is making. So while we're doing that, the problems that Trent is pointing out for national popular vote are actually worse under winner take all. And there's one thing I have to say about the French election. The French election is like the California primary election. It's top two. 
And national popular vote has nothing to do with primaries, and it's inaccurate to compare French's, France's way of electing a president to the way the United States does. No, whether, no matter which method that we do, and it's the same with Canada. Trent, I'm going to let you respond, but I'm also going to let you know we're nearing the end of our time to discuss this very important issue, so this will be your closing remarks. You know, it, so Ted is right, actually. The analogy to national popular vote is not the second round in the French election. It's the first. In the first round, uh, Macron got 23%, and NPV says, there you go, winner, right? 23%, you win, you win all the marbles, right? We're not even going to have a runoff. And uh, I mean, I, I think so. I mean, Ted's right, but it's it's even worse under national popular vote, right? You 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 win with 23 percent of the vote. Uh, I mean, look, you know, I, I'm with I'm with Winston Churchill, right? He said democracy, you know, by which I think he sort of meant a republic because he was in a parliamentary system. It's the worst form of government, acknowledging that you know it makes people feel unhappy in all kinds of ways. We all lose sometimes and win sometimes, but uh, uh, but he said except that every other form of government that's ever been tried is even worse. Right? And, and uh, I mean, look, I think that the Electoral College has served our country phenomenally well. It helped to sew us back together after the Civil War by forcing the Southern Democrats to reach out in the North, which I think is a part of why JFK became such a strong defender of the Electoral College, right? His family would have been alienated from politics if the Democrats could have won the White House based on just you know, a mix of voter suppression and driving up their, their vote totals in the, in the South. Right? That, that those are two of those elections that supposedly are wrong winner elections were when Democrats would have won the White House under an NPV system um, just because they had such regional intensity and, and some vote fraud in there as, as well. Um, it, it is so much better to have a system that says, look, right, you can't win just by driving up your popularity where you're already popular. You actually have to go out Republicans and campaign in Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin. And Democrats, if you think you can maybe win uh, in Utah, you have an incentive to go open an office there and talk to people there, right? These are good things about the Electoral College system. And we're going to keep power over elections at the state level. We're going to use state lines like the watertight compartments on an ocean liner, where if something goes wrong in the election in one state, it doesn't spill over and sink the whole ship. It's contained in that state. It can be, you know, it can be dealt with in court or can be dealt with by Congress. Um, but, uh, but we can keep power over elections decentralized, which makes us safer. These are all really good, really practical blessings of the Electoral College, and I think they should be preserved. The challenge with Trent's argument, particularly on plurality, is it is greater, it's a greater problem under the current system. I'll give you an example. If you take the battleground states that we've had you know, in 2012 and 2016, if you get 51% of the vote just in those battleground states, you can win the presidency because you win the Electoral College. You know what your percentage of the national popular vote is going to be? 24%. So if you think the plurality is a problem under national popular vote, you have a much bigger problem under uh, the current system with winner take all. The other flip side of this is the arguments that he's making are ones that are, literally you can apply to winner take all and it makes it worse. What we should be doing is making every, if, for example, I hope Trent runs a Republican campaign and I, under the current system and they spend a ton of money going out to Utah because Utah is reliably red. Every dime that they spend in Utah, they're wasting. And that's the problem we have with the system today. Three quarters of the states don't get a thing. They don't get any visits. And to say that that's representative and that's going to, be, going to protect uh, democracy is just ignoring what the truth is. And the truth is, under the current system, we're skewing, skewing public policy, and we're skewing how money, how money is distributed. So the best way, again, is make sure every vote counts, every vote in every state. And you can do that with a state-based, conservative, constitutional, preserve the Electoral College approach like the National Proper the Vote Compact. We have to leave it there. I have to say I was interested in this topic for two reasons. One is that I have a framed certificate that belonged to my late grandfather who was an elector in the Electoral College once upon a time. So I find that history fascinating. And for another thing, now I'm a Coloradan. I live in Colorado. And as I mentioned, our state legislature joined us to the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. But in 2020, we'll have a ballot referendum, an opportunity for us as voters in Colorado to weigh in on whether we want our state to stay in that interstate compact or not to stay as a part of that interstate compact. So that debate, the debate that we're having here today, 
uh, will determine if I'm so fortunate to follow in my grandfather's footsteps one day and be an elector in the Electoral College, it will determine the nature of that participation in government and how our presidents are elected. So please join me in thanking these two excellent panelists for this debate.